Come in. Hi, Tom, I've landed. Well done. Where are you at the moment? In Paul Street car park. Great. Um, will you hang on at the front door there and I'll be over to you, I'd say, in about three, four minutes. Great, thanks, Will. Very good. Cool. Okay. Bye. Bye. And welcome to Spokes the Podcast. I'm your host, Colette Colfer. Check one, two, check one, two. Testing one, two, three. And that's Terry Hackett. He's in charge of the technical side of things and the music. Testing the microphones again. This is the new C417, AKG C417 lapel mic. In this, our first episode, I travel to Cork City to meet the Irish poet Thomas McCarthy. Thomas, or Tom, was born in Capaquin in West Waterford in 1954, but has spent most of his adult life in Cork City. I catch up with him there and he brings me around to some of what he considers to be the architectural highlights of Cork City. And then we head up to his house where I meet his wife and he shows me the room where he works. I also interview him in front of a live audience at one of the Spokes open mic nights, which are held upstairs in Phil Grimes pub in Waterford City. OK. Yeah. Let's go. Hello. Hiya. Yeah. How are you? Good. Welcome to the... Welcome. Good day, so welcome in the middle of the park. <laughs> well, you're right in the heart of a, a historic old city anyway. Great. Where are you bringing me to? And go, well, well, I must bring you for a cup of coffee anyway to the far, the uh, English market, the Farmgate Cafe, oh, yeah. do you know it? Uh, yes. We are now in uh, Paul Street, in the Paul Street district, which was actually in the old days a, a warehouse district actually behind the main shopping areas. Now here we are in Rory Gallagher Square, because in the cafe there, Rory Gallagher, the wonderful guitarist, used to play when he was a teenager uh, in, in, in a coffee shop there. He played the guitar with a Cork accent always. He's a bit like myself, acquired a kind of a Cork accent. Right. We're in actually right here in the centre of Cork City. We're in the parish of St. Peter and Paul's. And here you have a church. Almost everything is hidden in Cork City. I mean, Cork people, even though people who are not from Cork tend to think of Cork people as very chauvinist people. In fact, they are complete, Cork people are completely ignorant about the built environment of Cork City. They have, they have no idea, none of them have been taught the history in schools right. of the city, of the history of their own city. So, as, I mean, I sometimes find it frustrating as a day shock, as a Waterford man coming into Cork that I'm telling Cork people all the time about their own city. So what's this, for example, about? is an absolutely incredible church, the Church of St. Peter and Paul. It's one of the last examples of really high Victorian Oxford church architecture. It was designed by Pugan, great church architect. Um, and open? built almost, you or? can, and I'll show it to you because it is incredibly unique. It wasn't affected, it wasn't stripped back after most Catholic churches, after Vatican II, it maintains that incredible sense of kind of Victorian high Catholicism. Oh, yeah. So have a look. But yeah. the story of it is incredible. It was built by Father Murphy, who in fact was a, a priest in the parish, but who had begun his adult life as a fur trapper and trader on the uh, Great Lakes of North America. And one day he met a Jesuit missionary on Lake Huron who said to him, what are you doing over here? You should be back in Ireland educating your own people who are so oppressed. So he went, sold his fur business and sent himself to Rome uh, and became ordained a priest. He came back here, still had family money. He was one of the Murphys of the brewing family and decided he would build a church for his parish. And this is the incredible gift he left his parish. It is amazing. It's, it's, completely, it's completely unchanged from the moment it was designed by Puja. It's been preserved beautifully. Um, look at those wooden angels. I just think they are incredible. They're like something you'd see in a kind of a 19th century print of a church, you know. 
um, and the beautiful windows. Do you come in here yourself? Like I sometimes come in here. Um, any kind of uh, sacred spaces have an attraction for me, you know, yeah. um, and places of contemplation. And uh, I mean, I suppose one of the great gifts of Catholicism is the fact that it is is happy with immense beauty, with immensities of beauty, um, which is, you know, quite different from other Christian churches that are based just on the word, if you like, of the Bible. But the church, in, in a way, enjoys the splendour of heaven. And it's, it's, in, it's in its architecture. It's absolutely fantastic. I know. I, I just said I wanted to show you. Yeah, this gorgeous. is a, this is a ninety second tour of Cork. Yeah, fantastic. I love the stained glass over yeah, the altar. It's beautiful. Anyway, it's interesting to see yeah, it. Beautiful. But it's all it's part of the kind of hidden treasure That's of Cork. Great, you know? because as many times as I come to Cork, yeah. I would never have walked nothing in here in the city. Thanks. Sorry. Nothing is signposted. Nothing is explained. I mean, uh, you know, there are many, many French visitors, for example, to Cork City because of the links, the ferry links with France. Um, and yet you see no signs in French anywhere to help our French visitors. Here we have Patrick Street, um, which is, of course, originally was the riverbed of the River Lee and was, was culverted over in the middle of the 18th century during the Great Wide Streets Commissioner's Days. But the architecture you see in Cork now, which is a very distinctly, it's not 18th century, in fact, in fact, it's the most beautiful example of 1920s department store architecture. Um, and it's one of the few preserved streets of such beautiful architecture, um, and all rebuilt after the burning of Cork in 1920. Well, we'll go across here. Okay. And um, tell us, you said 1920, the burning of Cork. Yeah, uh, December the 11th, the night of the... December the 11th and 12th, the burning of Cork City. And do you, why, why did this happen? It was burned by um, a British regiment from Victoria Barracks with the help of the RIC, who placed uh, gallons of petrol along all of the uh, front doors of the major department stores in the city uh, in a deliberate act of, of sabotage, you know. Um, there are many theories as to why it happened. I think myself it was mainly a, a huge grab by a, a regiment that must have known it was leaving Ireland. So they decided to burn the city and rob all the jewellery stores at the same time because there was very highly organised uh, thieving going on during the burning, um, which was almost a military act, uh, act you know. Um, it's never really been fully investigated, I think. You would need to follow the, the regiment and follow the records of... Uh, this is the Oyster Bar now, which used to be a wonderful restaurant. I remember 45 years ago. My God, think of it, 45 years ago, we're all getting so... I am getting so old, you're so young, I'm old. Being in here having dinner with the wonderful English poet Robert Graves. That was so exciting. I was in the English Lit Society at college, so I was one of the people who had to take him to dinner there at the Oyster. It was a most fantastic event in our lives. You know, meeting the great Graves, author of The White Goddess, yeah. and I, Claudius, and those great books. Here we are in the English market. Oh my God, loads of food everywhere. We'll go, just go around here. English market called such because in order to trade here when the English market was set up, you had to uh, take the oath of allegiance to the English crown. So there was a, a, a market for Catholics at the other side of town, the Gold Key, as it was called. But here was where the kind of most prosperous traders, and, and mainly Protestant traders, were. This is a real treasure of Cork City, isn't it? And it is all really the fruit it, and vegetables, the butchers, yeah, the bread, everything. That's my favourite place. Oh, is it? The cakes and pastries. But wonderful oh, vegetables. Oh, great smell. Yeah. So, I thought we'd... we'd but the Queen visited here, didn't she? She did indeed. Here? Yeah, she did. Let me just... Uh, um, no, let's go for a coffee first. Right. Okay, we'll go upstairs. Okay. As I say, this lovely restaurant and cafe was set up by um, two O'Brien sisters originally, um, Kay Hart and Morogo O'Brien, um, with their Waterford connections, of course. Um, and now it's one of the dominant cafes of Cork City Centre. But Amazing. one of the things that... Like that's, the architecture here is uh, just stunning. It, it is lovely. And one of the things that, that Kay did was she commissioned all the poets in around the country 
to write a poem in their own handwriting. And she had a, an artist and a, some kind of a, a process around which she preserved each of the handwriting. And so now that you have the poetry wall, the exhibition of poems. So just go, yeah, have a yeah. quick look at it. Yeah. So it's who's it's who's lovely to see everybody. Is there one by yourself? Oh, there is, yeah. Yeah. Hello. We're actually just going to show her the poetry wall. That's all I'm doing. I'm just going to show her the poetry wall. Oh, yeah, no, I don't. Thanks. <laughs> there you are. There it is. Oh, look at oh, that. Oh, look. There's John Montague, Colin Bernock, Liz O'Donoghue, Greg Delante, Matthew Suyemi, Michael Longley, Seamus Heaney is here, and myself. It's beautiful to actually see the handwriting. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. It's a kind of window into the soul, in some way, handwriting, you know? Yeah. So this... Yeah, I saw you in, in Waterford. You gave a lovely talk about Sean John. Is that true? Oh, that was me. That, you? that was me. Oh, yeah, was in the pub on the key, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. That was a great day. I was day. really delighted. That was a great to hear day. Yeah. Thanks for that. I'm from Waterford, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah Waterford. A day shot. <laughs> Very good. Let's <laughs> guess. Okay, how are you? Hi. Can I call for podcaster extraordinaire, hi. Kay Hart, proprietor of the oh, cafe nice. we've just been in. Oh, I was showing her oh, the nice poetry wall. Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. It's fabulous. Oh, Isn't you. it? Keep Great going. to see you. You're certainly in very good company. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so myself and Tom are walking around Cork City and I'm holding recording equipment and there's cables coming out of it and I'm conscious of trying to mind everything and Terry our technical guru has kind of given me instructions on how to work everything and the thing Terry was most nervous about was that I'd lose the brand new windshields for the clip on mics here we are it's not raining it's not too bad anyway if it was we'd have to oh shit I've lost some things you cut have Here you? we have to retrace our steps. Okay. Do you mind? Not at all. Uh, what is the word for it? Uh, muffler? Uh, yeah. Muffler? Yeah. yeah no, we're we're, we're looking for a black muffler. We think oh, we've yeah. lost it. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'd say the cafe is the best bet. Yeah, we'll have a look now. Oh, yeah. We're looking for something I think I left behind here. A little muffler like that. Another one? Yeah, I lost one. I, I saw in the bin. Oh, could you see it? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank oh, you're so great. Much. You're brilliant. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> see you again. Yeah. Going to have... well, mind you said you're in ten. Right. That was oh, great Jesus. that you found that now, isn't it? Brilliant. Because, like, even though it's a tiny thing, it's a crucial little. Yeah. Um, and I love that she said, oh, I throw it in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> now, you worked in a library. In the city library? Yeah. For many, many, many years. Yeah. Cork City Library. I worked in various branches, oh, including right, yeah. the Central Library in Grand Parade. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. Loved working in libraries. Loved kind of following what people were reading, you know. Was there trends? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I've lost it again, Tom. I don't believe it. Unreal. There, see it blowing down the street. Here. Okay. Hang on, I've to unta attach myself. Which one am I? Number one. I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. So now we're going to add the next music into it. I'll need you to direct me as well. Oh yeah, I know I'll do that. That's no problem. Straight on. So the, the place is, we're going. This now. is where I lived when we, uh, Catherine and I, were married first. Really? For several years, we we lived on the top floor of that lovely building. Oh, amazing! Six Sydney place. With in the same house with uh, the poet Sean Dunn and his wife Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, Sean Dunn from Orford. 
So you were good friends? Very good friends. Going down the hill to the right here now, this little park, sort of. And we'll try and find a parking space. Down here. This is the old house. Now, welcome in. Hi. Here we are. Very good. Hello. Hi. Hello, Colette. Nice to meet Catherine. you. Catherine Coakley. Well, do you remember meeting him for the first time? Oh, I do, yeah. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Well, we met at a wedding. We did. And, uh, I mean, I... We haven't stopped talking since then. No, we haven't. And uh, we've, we've been together ever since. That's, that's it, really. Uh, we started going out, uh, meeting each other. Tom had an old Renault car. <laughs> and on our very first date... When I sat in, I put my foot through the floor. I was absolutely mortified. But, of course, the car was riddled with rust because it was an old Renault. Uh, but anyway, he didn't hold it against me. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was fantastic, actually, that he had a car. Not that many people had cars then. Mm. So Not that many you. young single men. It did, I suppose, yeah. And the poetry. The poetry, definitely, yeah. The poetry definitely impressed me. I mean, I would say that, you know, when I go to poetry readings and when Tom starts reading, and it's, it, I know it sounds very uh, mushy, but I kind of feel like I'm falling in love with him all over again when he starts reading, because he has a lovely voice. And, um, you know, I just think he's a wonderful poet, really. You can't beat the Waterford voice when it comes out. <laughs> Oh, it's not all hunky dory. I mean, we're yeah. a normal married couple, yeah. so you know. And uh, yeah. but I think the most beautiful thing here is the river, and seeing the ships coming in and out. Mm -hmm. It's really, and you sometimes you, you know, when you're in bed, you'd hear the hum of the ship coming up the river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You and, can actually uh, see like the city stretching and then into the countryside. Yeah, the when you go upstairs now to Tom's study, you'll you'll see the the river and the the docks. And it's lovely to see the ships unloading. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, will we run up? Yeah. Do we'll off you go. This is the only un really untidy room in the house now. Oh, well, you're right up at the top, are you? Yeah, on your head. So do you hang out here every day now? Every day for hours and hours and hours and hours. Really? Like I could, might spend eight to twelve hours in that room. Not just writing though. Kathy reading. would come up now and again to you know make sure I hadn't died. <laughs> Good. And this is my room. So now here we go. Wow, a lot of books. Wall to wall in books. And this is this is a good now. Here's your good view of Cork. Oh look, the sun glinting on the river there. What's that big road over there? Is that the ring road on the far side it or is. something? Yeah, that's the South Ring Road. Yeah. God, you can really see everything here. Yeah, yeah. And that stadium there, what's that? Parky Cueve, the great Parky Cueve. So this um, is where you hang out then? These are my, yeah, these are my books. Um, I tried to stop buying books, but it's nearly impossible. I said 4,000 books is enough, really, for anyone. I, I gave away about 1,000 uh, a few years ago, but honest to God, I'd say I'm back up. I mean, look, these all need shelves. Books on chairs, on the books floor, on the floor, books on everywhere. Chests, on bookshelves, on top of the bookshelves. A typical. Desks. <laughs> but I mean, what can you do? So you come up here morning. This evening, is my office, and you kind of would spend the day reading. And the whole writing. day, reading and writing, yeah. And yeah. do you have a kind of a routine of how much you'd read, how much you'd write, or are you reading to research, or is it just? I don't really have a pattern. Like, I have a pattern of coming up here and sitting down. Because, like, you have to be sitting down. And unless you're sitting down, you might miss a poem that would be in the air, you know? So the main aim is, is the poetry, really, then? Oh, totally, 100%. Would you write every day? Don't write poetry every day, no. But I, there's no day goes by that I don't think about it. So, and um, when you're working on a poem, would you finish that poem before you move on to the next one or would you stick to one poem or I'd finish the first draft alright the early draft you know yeah 
Sometimes a poem would just come to you, you know. So that's a first draft there. Just, yeah, came to me straight away, yeah. Yeah. And, would you and funny enough, it's about a goldfinch. And it's about Catherine putting out these Niger seeds for a goldfinch. And no sign of a goldfinch for days. And Catherine says, he'll come. He'll find the Niger seeds. It's amazing. They find the seeds. Like, how do they do Who tells them? Like, that if somebody has put out Niger seeds. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And so you write on a... Do you write on the same material as the yellow pad? Fool's cap kind of I size? love the... Ever since I was in America, I love the old yellow legal pad. Yeah. Um, to me, it says work. When you even look at it, it says work. Um, we, we talked briefly earlier about when we weren't recording but now I am recording so I'll ask you again sure. <laughs> about the idea of the muse is there a muse? There is if you need one your need will make a muse I have no doubt about that um, but I don't think there is a, a, a creature out there called the muse that makes your poetry, you know. Um, I think your muse is your unconscious, your unconsciousness. Like your best muse could probably be if you had a very good psychotherapist. That would be a real muse. Would bring out the hidden things. Or at least make things surface that are stresses or obsessions. Make you articulate articulate what what's hidden I think that would be the real muse you know um, I mean when you're very young you probably have the romantic idea that somebody is out there who is your muse and in a sense that is that is true you know I was just thinking because uh, the I'm whole still writing. Poem is exactly. Catherine. Yeah. First decent poem I wrote, I think, uh, my first decent adult poem um, was in a collection called The Sorrow Garden. You read it in Waterford. You read the poem, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And that, I think that was the first. And I remember having written it, I said to myself, this was about three weeks, two weeks maybe after I met Cathy. Um, and she brought me in to see her dark room. She was doing a lot of printing of black and white photographs at that time. Um, and I wrote this poem, The Phenomenology of Stones, about the stones she'd been photographing. And it was the first real poem. So, as I say, yesterday I wrote about the goldfinch, her goldfinch. So she is your muse in a, in a certain, yeah, 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 a certain yeah, yeah. extent in that yeah, regard? Absolutely. Then. She's certainly the sole companion of my poetry. That's one sure thing. Mm. There is no other companion. What do you mean? There just is nobody else, really. Um, as the companion of the poems I write, you know. When you said soul, I wasn't sure what S O U L or S O L E. S O L E. Okay. She's, at this stage, she's definitely the sole companion of any, anything I would write, you know. Yeah. Um, it is a. Uh, it is an astonishing process, you know, the way one person becomes attached to what you do. So in a way they become the single and sole interpreter almost of who you are. And, uh, you know, I said to Cathy one day, I don't think there is a single other person on this earth who knows who I am. And like... That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. Um, and I, I would say that there's probably a, not a single other person on earth who knows who she is, really. Um, kind of behind the mask, is it? Uh, yeah, the behind the persona, behind the the public persona, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, she's a much more private person than I am. I've never been a private person. Um, even though I've been a solitary person, but not, not private. Um, I think I've been remonstrating in public like since I was 10 years old.
She's just here. Hi everybody and um, you're very welcome and thanks very much for coming. Our special guest poet Tom McCarthy has travelled by bus, which he loves, from Cork tonight. So very welcome to Tom. And our guest musicians are Jazabelle. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you When I was in secondary school in St Anne's co-ed school, um, there were 15 girls and 5 boys in my class in school, secondary school. So at the age, between the age of 13, 14, 15, I was really only interested in science. Um, I was interested in chemistry, physics, biology. In fact, I was doing, uh, uh, in second year, I started doing a kind of a project on electrostatics, hoping I might get it ready for the Young Scientist exhibition before I left school. And then um, Sister Carmel in the school asked me would I edit a school magazine. Um, you know, I was one of those children in the school who were always asked to do things, uh, always sent for messages, doing things. Um, and so I said, yeah, sure. So we put a magazine together. My sports correspondent, I remember appointing it, was John Tracy, mm -hmm. subsequently the, the Olympic runner. Wow. Um, so it was a good magazine called The Golden Fleece. And I was very proud of it until I gave a copy to the local hardware merchant in Capoquen, <laughs> Frank Walsh, um, Austin Walsh, sorry, and Austin said to me, do you know that's the name of a pan scourer, the Golden Fleece? <laughs> and, I, and he showed me proudly the Golden Fleece. Um, but I had two poems. We had no poems. So then again, sis, the same Sister Carmel said to me, um, she said, you know, we, we need some poems, really. We have essays and we have things and no poems. So I wrote two poems. Um, and the poems were published in the magazine. Um, that was Christmas of 1969. And a few days after Christmas, I got a letter in the post from the most spectacularly beautiful girl in the school, um, enclosing a photograph of herself at a dance in Tallow. Um, and she was saying, I loved reading your poems. She said, um, Miss, I've forgotten which teacher it was, said, did Thomas really write those poems? And I, she said, I certainly told her you were a poet. She said, would you mind meeting me before the, summer before the Christmas holidays are over? So suddenly I was reminded of the power of poetry <laughs> to grab attention. Um, because it's nearly always about me rather than anything else, isn't it? Um, so that taught me the power of communication the power of poetry um, to move this person. In fact, the other day when I was tidying stuff at home, I found a letter and the photograph. I kept it. But of course I kept it because it was all about me. <laughs> you know, again, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that poetry is first and foremost the story of our journey. Okay. Uh, so that's fascinating because he just kind of landed into it. it wasn't necessarily something that you sought, but it kind of came. Yeah, uh, somebody I think asked so. you. Yeah, yeah. And before that point, had you read poetry? I Did had. Did you like poetry? And I loved my my father had you know poems from the old um, anthologies of the nineteen forties. Um, there was a Christian Brothers anthology of poems published, I think, in the late thirties, called Flowers for Many Gardens. And my father remembered several poems he learned by her. And he was always particularly reciting for my younger brother, Kevin, who was six years younger than me, The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Long, long ago, what is it? When I was a little fellow, a piper wandered through my door, grey-haired, blind and yellow. Oh, how young was my young heart. Something, something up in the morning early to see the piper and his dog, poor Pinch and Quaik O'Leary. And so it was a poem by John Keegan. Um, and I think the pleasure of that and listening to my father reciting it, um, and he taught my little brother, who was like, I think only four then, slowly taught him the poem, I remember. Um, and my little brother used to pronounce barley, boorly. So, of course, he was always asked to recite the poem because everybody wanted to hear him pronouncing the boorly. Um, and so that kind of sound and um, pleasure that poetry can give 
by being repeated. I think that, that impinged its way into my consciousness. But really, after I received that letter, um, really, science like went to the dogs. So did my maths. <laughs> I dropped out of doing honours maths. I did just pass maths instead of honours maths. I mean, it was a complete deterioration of a promising life, you know? Hey, and so <gasps> then did you get a grow for it yourself? Like Oh yeah. I mean so I was completely hooked. I kept writing poem after poem after poem. I filled copy books at school with my poems. Um now there was another interesting thing. This talk talk about attention. Like that there was that lovely letter. Um um and then I received another letter addressed to me at the school. And the letter was from a big mansion, an Anglo-Irish mansion, which in fact later became a hotel, White Church House, near Kappa in County Waterford. Um, but at that time it was the home of a brilliant uh, historian of Russia and Ukraine and Georgia called William Edward David Allen. And it was a letter from Mr. Allen. And the letter said, Dear Thomas, I've been reading your poems in your school magazine, which my gardener brought to me from Capaquen. So he said, if I send my chauffeur to your school gates at 4 p.m. next Tuesday, will you come to tea? Wow. So I thought it was the most natural thing in the world. The Mercedes <laughs> pulled up. <laughs> I got in. And the way you collected me in a taxi today... Um, I thought it was the most natural thing in the world for a poet to be driven around in a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> and off I went, and I was received at the door by um, Mr. Allen's butler, I remember. Mr. Allen will be with you presently. And it, then I was introduced to Mr. Edwards, his secretary. And Mr. Allen at that stage had the most amazing, one of the greatest collections of Slavic p books, in fact, which were later acquired by the University of Pennsylvania, he had 20,000 books in that house, in Whitechurch House. He spoke Russian, uh, Aramaic, Turkish, uh, German, French. Um, so he was a very interesting man, Mr. Allen. And Mr. Allen said, I'm going to send your poems to Terence Beer White, my friend Terence Beer White, who was the literary editor of the Irish Times. So... By the time I was 17, I had my first poem published in the Irish Times. <laughs> and Terence didn't publish me again for five years. I think he just published me first to please Bill Allen. Wow. And then would, you know, then treated me normally as if I was just sending in poems. And at 15 then, did you consider yourself a poet? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. I mean, once you've written a poem, you're a poet. Okay. I mean, you're a poet. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Anyway, it's a posthumous designation, I think, in reality. But, I mean, you're, if you're a person who writes poems, you're a poet. Don't worry about whether you're a poet or not. Um, those who love you will always know you as a poet. You know, so the, the critics may not. So how did it feel? I mean, to you, this was the most normal thing in the world. Then Absolutely. You, you were, so were you, in a way, the poet of Kappa Quinn, would you say, as a teenager? Yeah, definitely. I had a right... <laughs> I had, a ri I had a rival, Padraig of Fenusa, the Irish teacher, who was a poet as well, wrote an Irish Asgoelga and wrote many books. Um, but even Padraig acknowledged me as a poet and would address me as a poet and would talk to me about culture and Ireland and national duty as if he was a patriot talking to a poet. Um, so that was kind of serious stuff. Uh, so being a poet was serious. That's what I was just going to ask you. Was it something that was weighty? Was it something that was a heavy thing? Was there a sense of duty? Was it light and frivolous? Was there a spiritual element? How did it? What did that? It wasn't feel light like? or frivolous, and it certainly wasn't spiritual. Um, I don't think I'm a spiritual person. I think I'm a materialist. I mean, I think I have been a um, an atheist since I was about seven years old. Now I consider myself a lapsed atheist. <laughs> I'm kind of becoming closer and closer to the church as I get older. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is, but um, it, aspects of the church attract me more and more and more. 
and its certainties and beauty. Um, but really, I was an absolute atheist. Yeah, okay. and poetry was a humanist responsibility in the world. In in what sense? In what that poets mean? were had a national public duty to lead. Um, not, I mean, by standing up on platform or going for election, but uh, to lead um, by thinking about their country and thinking about their culture and by thinking about your culture and whether your people are doing well or not is a kind of leadership. That's what I felt. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Allen, W.E.D. Allen, the great scholar in Whitechurch House, who was, in fact, when I met him that day, he was carrying a new edition of Lermontov's poems, the great Lermontov, the Russian poet, and he recited a, one of Lermontov's poems in Russian to me and translated it, um, and telling me about the tragedy of Lermontov's life. Um, and he said to me, of course, all Russian poets are tragic. He said, uh, he said, not like you Irish poets, he said, you know, you seem to get away with things. So um, success in some sense came early then, like in Kappa Quinn. It did. But you went from Kappa Quinn then and you studied English, am I right? In yeah, English, English in geography. In and in a sub, uh, sub uh, I also did monitored, I did actually the entire BA as well in, in archaeology. Okay, yeah. so by the time you got to, to UCC, you were out of small town Ireland where you had a name Not for really. yourself. No. 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 Like I was still focused on Kappa Quinn because I was uh, working my way, like my family were dirt poor, my family were incredibly poor. My father became ill, mentally ill, um, around the time I'd say I was seven years old and never in fact effectively worked after that in his life. And um, so we basically were a family who grew up on social welfare. So we all, I had to work, I mean I worked all through my secondary school from about the in fact from about the age of eight I worked in the morning before school first job was delivering papers for Fraher's news agents in Capoquin to Fraher's sisters fantastic people great patriots um, then I after that when I went into secondary school I, I delivered milk in the mornings um, before school so I would rise about half five between five, half five and six every morning. I would have three hours work done by the time I arrived in school, physical work. Sometimes my hands in the winter wouldn't unfreeze. I wouldn't be able to write for about an hour. The teachers in the secondary school always knew it. They'd excuse me for the first hour um, because my hands were so frozen from the milk bottles. Why do you keep writing poetry? I just can't stop. Um, I can't stop. In fact, the last four years, do I say, and I say it to my wife in bed, and I get her to repeat it to me, fewer, better. <laughs> Write fewer poems, better. Do that next year. Fewer, better. Stop writing 40 poems a year. Write 10, better. And I say that to her, but I can't control it. Um, is, does, is there a thing that that's better, that's better? Like, how do you... How oh, do yeah. Okay, great. Oh, it's depressing how many bad poems you write, <laughs> on average. <laughs> and you, can, you, can you identify what Oh yeah, well, this, the real skill is identifying. Yes. Like, um, the la my last book, Prophecy, um, I'm sure I had 200 poems, but, like, I couldn't find more than about 60 good poems in that 200, you know, for Prophecy. And what is good, like so? First of all, that the poem doesn't disappoint the expectations you've set up in the first two lines. Generally, what disappoints the structure of a poem is actually sentimentality of some kind that has crept in, and the poem becomes mawkish in some way, where you're no longer attending to the needs of the language, you're just attending to your own feelings. Like poetry is not a letter to yourself, it's not a letter to anybody. Poetry is a construct, it's a three-dimensional thing and you better realise you're making something when you're writing a poem. It's not a self-indulgence about, oh I must write down my, my horrible feelings. That's not poetry, that's writing horrible feelings down on paper. <laughs> poetry is what you think about those horrible feelings and writing that. 
it's tricky. Um, I'll ask you one more question and then I'll open it up to see if anybody, because I know probably people, <coughs> but I mean, many people, <coughs> as you know, in this room are writers. Yeah. So advice to people <coughs> writing poetry. I'm sure people would love to hear what you'd have to say. <laughs> well, to my, my, my advice to people always is to write. Yeah. If you're a writer, you must be right. Like I'll always remember years ago, Robert Graves, the, the, the great English poet who had Irish connections with the Limerick Graves, of course. Um, and to say his, un his grandfather's summer house was actually in County Kerry in, in Parknasilla, that beautiful hotel, um, was a Graves summer house for many years. But anyway, Robert Graves was asked when he was at UCC, I remember one day in the lecture room, somebody asked him, you know, have you any advice for budding poets and he said budding poets if you're budding come into bloom <laughs> and I think that was as good a piece of advice um, the there's a great kind of temptation to find talking about poetry attractive more attractive than actually writing it <laughs> writing it is harder <laughs> um, getting pen on paper getting black on white as the writer Frank O'Connor said is the difficult part I would say, like, if you're in any way serious about your poetry, you need to sit down for two hours every day. There's really no other way. You need to do that for seven years. And then, if after that you don't have some good poems, like you, you then need to take up hurling or knitting <laughs> <laughs> for seven years and try again then. Okay, great. Um, I, we'll just take one or two questions. Is, any, is anybody bursting with a question they'd love to ask Tom? You don't have to be bursting with a question. Do you have yeah. a question? Yeah. Did you ever doubt yourself? As a poet? Yes. Like, y y yes and no, um, but mainly no. Um, but there would be times when, I mean, early in, in the 1980s, when I published a succession of books with Anvil Press Poetry in England, a very good, beautiful publisher um, who brought out lovely books for me. Now, there were some searing and vicious attacks, reviews of those books. Um, and kind of... When I got a succession of attacks like that, like it used to depress me. Um, actually, no. It used to it used to make me angry. There's a difference between anger and doubt. Um, when you're angry, you still know who you are. Um, no. So the answer is no, really. Do we have another poem? Okay. Um, I I'll read it. Uh, Sorry. This is a very a very early poem from a book called The Sorrow Garden, 1981. A book that brought me a lot of luck. Um, the most important bit of luck that it brought me really was it kind of, in a way, confirmed my attractiveness to my future wife. Um, <coughs> you know, I had to beat off a lot of guys to get her. <laughs> but poetry was my deadly weapon in the process. Um, so she's still with me. The phenomenology of stones. She, she was doing, she was in her final year in the art college at Crawford. She was doing a degree in sculpture and photography. So, so sculpture and stones and things were her, her thing. And still are to some extent. The phenomenology of stones for Catherine. These summer days I carry images of stone. Small pebbles from a photographer's shelf made smooth by a million years of sea and salt. Sunlight shines roundly into their small room, twisting black grains into crystals and gems. Lights call like young birds from their surfaces, sparrows of light flying from graves, from places where the dead had grown, the sorrow gardens. But the silence of stone quietens the mind and calms the eye. Like their girl collector, in her deep solitude, the stones are moved. She is their dream collector, pouring her kindness into their sleeping form. They gather fables about themselves to entertain such love. My love, my 
one and only love Let me take you out under the moonlight And show how the twilight loves the night How he lives for an If you've made it this far, you've come to the end of our first Spokes podcast. Thanks a million for joining us. We've really enjoyed making this and we hope you've enjoyed listening. I'd like to thank a few people. Thanks to the live audience at Phil Grimes. Thanks to Jazabel, who played the music on the night. Thanks to Tom at Phil Grimes for the venue. Thanks to Margaret Organ and the Arts Office of Waterford City and County Council who give us grant assistance for those nights in Phil Grimes. Thanks to Thomas McCarthy, of course, and also his wife, Catherine. They were both so brilliant and so generous with their time. And uh, finally, just a shout out to my son, Stevie Hackett, who also gave us a little bit of help. Please like and subscribe and share the video. <laughs> there is no video. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast! Oh, come on! Oh, come on! Oh, come on.